Welcome to the Salty Investors episode 22. It is Friday, March 3rd. How are you, Tim? Yeah, great. Yourself? Yeah, not too bad. Um, not much to complain about, but let's hear about your complaints this week. What's the salt? Oh, just Australians are a bit addicted to government spending. Um, Jim oh, Chalmers. You don't say. <laughs> Jim Chalmers just came out saying, oh, there's going to be a $50 billion hole in super. Um, and he tried to rip $2 million out of Australians and everyone's lost their mind. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I just looked up the figures for COVID. It cost us $291 billion. So if we put that on That'll... the credit, yeah, $290 billion. And if we, you know, if you just started, people tried to pay back, put that on the credit card and try to pay it back, you know, like we're going to be up for mm. a hundred years paying it at $2 billion a year. Um, mm. It's just people seem to be keen on the spending side. You know, people like Koshy, you know, mm. oh, when COVID hit, you know, we've all got to, everyone's got to get a bailout. Everyone's got to get, you know, paid to stay at home. But when the bill comes due, no one wants to know about it. Mm. And I'm, mm. I'm just a bit worried. What's going to happen in the hard times when we've built up all this debt? You know, there's nothing to, to draw on here. You know, we're going to be, <laughs> be looking at each other going, oh, I wish we didn't spend all this, you know, but, you know, just I think it's a bit, yeah, a bit too crazy. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> The hard times are here, Tim. The hard times are here. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, the hard yeah. times are here with, you know, the, we've got a massive bill come due. I mean, yeah, actually, I mean the, the reality is we make out like our mining sector is a bunch of rent seekers when it's sort of the other way around. I mean, <laughs> the mining brings in a huge amount of money. Um, we're trying to destroy that at the same time, um, you know, we – We've never had as much debt in our lives. So yep. it's a strange, strange old country. <clears throat> mm. Yeah. So what are we going to do when I actually go ask for a handout? You know, there's going to be nothing there, you know, and we're going to, no. no one wants Australian dollars. We're not like the US, you know, printing USD, you know, everyone wants those mm. things. No one wants Australian dollars. How can we keep getting away with this for so long? No. I don't know. What are you salty about this week? Um. As you know, GDP came out for the quarter ended December last year, 0.5% for the quarter. Um, GDP per capita, which is a bit of overall measure of standard of living, was flat. GDP per capita in the previous quarter was also flat. Um, now, right now, the Labor government is pouring over 400,000 people into the country this year. And it's strange to me that... Um, the vast majority of the public are against this, and yet we continue to do it. So there's a report out from the um, Population Research Institute out of Monash University, and they found that 70% of people think we should return to immigration levels somewhat lower, you know, mm -hmm. like back to the about 240,000. 70% of Australians think that. Um, and and within that, within the other 30%, 13% of people say they don't know. So it's only about 17% of people actually think it should be at where it is or higher. So, you know, what gives? Why are we doing this? Oh, well, obviously, we want more GDP without investing in it. You know, we don't, yeah. don't want to invest in roads and hospitals. We just want the number to go up and get more tax dollars and everyone feel like they're actually being more productive. When we're not being yeah. productive, as you can see in the per capita number, it's not going anywhere. I think it's probably negative if you're probably. Well, sort of... I mean, yeah, that, of course, that's an overall standard of living, um, which is distorted by all kinds of effects. But I would say the vast majority of Australians have seen their standard of living go backwards in the last, you know, call it 12 months, I suppose, and will continue. I mean, remember that uh, we'll get onto this uh, later in the show when we, we talk about you know the inflation number that came out and the rest of it but um we never really got a wage price spiral going wages yeah. started to pick up a little bit but they're mm -hmm. you know wages are you know three four three four percent behind inflation uh yeah uh, so <clears throat> yeah i mean uh i think we've said this before that I think governments, it doesn't matter, both sides of politics, basically ran out of ideas how to increase productivity because productivity yep. gains are hard. Yep. I mean, they are. Um, and so what you do is you just funnel more people in the country. GDP grows. You go, look, our GDP is higher than the OECD average. Aren't we good? Pat yourself on the back. Meanwhile, standard of living 
in you know large cities, Sydney, Melbourne, um, probably going backwards for a lot of people because your access to amenities, schools, hospitals, roads, that the amount of time you spend in traffic is getting worse. Yep. You know. Um, mm. And yeah. Yeah, it's all right. If you live in Canberra, around. I'm pretty sure you. you know. <laughs> You're not impacted yeah. as hard as you living in the middle of Sydney somewhere. So, yeah. 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 Same old story. Um, all right. Let's get to some economic stuff. Uh, this came out. When did this come out? Just a couple of days ago. Was it yeah. Wednesday? Mm-hmm. Um, now, big drop, 8.4% to 7.4%. <laughs> woo, we're saved. Uh, woo, yeah, it's, it's over. all over, Tim. It's over. The <laughs> RBA doesn't need to go again. Now, remember that wages growth oh, sorry um the cash rate is about here right mm. you know that's that's where the cash rate is that's where the inflation rate is now there's a theory that you can't really start easing when inflation's this high until you get the cash rate above inflation obviously those like oh. as inflation comes down the cash rate will go up mm-hmm. um i would say that this report was probably the RBA was encouraged by this because they want to see, you know, this is good for them. They don't need to hike as much, but I still think they're going to go next month. Oh, yeah. Whether they go to 4.1 as some of, you know, we've we reported before some of the, some of the um, economists out there think that they will, whether they do or not, I don't know, but um, it's probably a step in the right direction for them. But again, you know, cash rate's still only 3.35 and wages are only growing at, about three, three and a half percent, I think. So um, things are moving in their favour. Um, just yep. have to wait and see if this is a, continues. Yeah, I think it will, but it's still a long way to go. Like um, mm. um, those two, they've got to match up somewhere along the line here. So um, yep. yeah, yeah, remember, absolutely. Core Logic has said housing is actually, you know, pretty flat or going up in Sydney. So yep. that's not looking... The RBA is going to be looking at that very closely and thinking, wow, might, I don't think they've got at least 50 more in them, not another two hikes. What do you think? What are you, what's your gut feeling on this? So, I, yeah, that's where I was. If, if anything, I, I thought two more. Um, I mean, I, I definitely thought one more, mm-hmm. but probably base my central case was two more. This makes me think maybe they can do one more and hold and wait oh. and see. Oh, okay. I mean, but you know, I, I cost it toss a coin, three point six, three point eight five, I don't really care. It's you know, I, I, I don't know. Um yeah. um yeah, could be either. But you know, I, either way I still think there's um I think we've said before that the US seemed to be in front of us, you know, that they their inflation peaked earlier, ours was later. Um we might be catching up and catching up quickly. Yep. You know, because I think our housing market is going to take more of a mm-hmm. toll on final demand than say in the US because so many people are mortgages are resetting because we don't have 30 year fixed mortgages. Uh, it's not affecting the US as much. Um, so, yeah, I think maybe we, we are going to catch up quite quickly that our, our economy will, I'm not saying it's going into free fall or anything, but it, it, it'll decline. Mm. <clears throat> quicker than say the us there's less resiliency there that's what i'm saying because of how leveraged we are yeah, and you've got people like the cba hiking even before the rba hikes you know next <laughs> week so yeah um they're getting ahead of the curve here a little bit so yeah when yeah. that happens like you like you told before we haven't got fixed mortgages here so hmm. i'm gonna be sucking a lot of that extra liquidity out of the market a lot quicker so yep yeah at some point it has to matter at some point it has to matter. Um, maybe uh, let me just know why that's not. You got you got the turn off the drawing thing. thing. Uh, that's probably why. Yeah. All right. So that was um, yeah. As we mentioned during my salt. So GDP zero point five um, for the quarter it was less than expected. 0.78 or was the estimate? I mean, people should know that in the US, they usually report GDP annualized. We report it on a quarterly basis. So quarter, uh, that would be commensurate with a 2% rate. I think for the year to December, it was 2.7 or something like that. So okay. not terrible. Yep. But it is obviously decelerating. 
Um, yeah, I thought this was interesting. Um, just back to the previous point about how much firepower we've got left, the household savings rate is, you know, back down to pretty much the lows of the last 10 years. Yep. So all of that excess savings, I mean, look at that COVID, um, you know, the, what was it? 290 billion that was spent during COVID. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, Disappeared. you know, we've basically <laughs> spent all of that down. Similarly, you remember in the US, we talked about this probably a month or so ago, how they basically spent that excess uh, $2 trillion or whatever it was down. So, I mean, we're down there again. Um, yeah, just just thought that that was interesting. You, you, at some point, something's got to give, I think. You know, you've got mm. so many pressures on, um, you know, the consumer and, ba and households, basically. Uh yeah. Rents are high um, and forecast to there's going to be still further rental squeezes this year. Mm. Um, although, yeah. Um, righto. Um, yeah. So this this was from Hussman's latest um, newsletter. I think it was out a couple of weeks ago. Um, so, I mean, why am I doing this? Because I like when smart people agree with me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, because I'm not smart, and I like so this is this is this is a this is an exercise in confirmation bias. Yes. So, <laughs> reinforcing the, the your two, biases here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it, it's a fair point. Look, the 2022 decline did nothing but remove the most extreme froth from valuations, leaving the price sales multiple the S and P above the level it reached at the 2000 bubble peak. So, I mean, that that is that's not nothing. I mean, we have uh, price to sales ratios above the 2000 peak. Right, which used to be, you know, among the worst in history. Um, I mean, look, look at that. Two point three, we got two in two thousand. In twenty twenty one, it was three point two. It's back to two point four. Remember, it's back to two point four with interest rates having gone from basically zero to four and a half in the United States. And that's yeah, it's worth thinking about. And so, um, as he says, to expect an, uh, an extended market advance from here is essentially to view the area in the red box as the new normal. And, you know, that's mm -hmm. hard to do. Um, I could but... push back a bit against this a little bit. Yep. <laughs> well, Go ahead. Yeah, well, margins have improved a lot since the 2000s. Um, yep. So I wouldn't be using price to sales. I'd be using price to cash flows or something like that. I don't know why I use price to sales, but... Um, Maybe it just makes his own. It, it yeah, serves his own. yeah, yeah. But I know, I know, margins have improved a lot. Like mm. Companies are making more money. You know, the margins have improved a heap since two thousand. So, mm. um, I don't know. If that yeah, well, that's the, that's sort of the conundrum of the last twenty years because margins mm. are supposed to be the most mean reverting series yes. in economics, and yet they they uh, remain steadfastly um, yeah. refuse to mean revert. Mm -hmm. um, I think we went over the arguments before about how tech companies asset light yeah. margins are sort of permanently up. Um, mm. But on the other side, competition is supposed to erode that. Um, yep. Who knows? Will we ever see margin erosion in our lifetime? <laughs> um, it's not, <laughs> yeah. don't know. Um, and also, yeah, another smart person that's um, sort of agreeing here is Jim, Jim Chanos, which you, I, you know, mm. have an enormous amount of respect for. Um yeah, I, I love this. That um, it reminds me of October two thousand when the Nasdaq was on its way to go down eighty percent. I think it, I think it actually went down eighty three percent after the first drop. People thought stocks got really cheap as valuations dropped from ten times revenue to five times revenue. Well, valuation was on its way to two times. It should never have been at ten times. You know, um, if there's, you know, I'm very wary of analogs because it doesn't mean just because something happened in the past it'll happen again, but. Mm -hmm. For me, and we've said this before, that 2000 is the best analog for what's happening now, I think. Yeah. Um, it was largely, again, the financial crisis was a debt bubble. The 2000 uh, tech wreck was an equity bubble. This has largely been an equity bubble. Well, Grantham called it an everything bubble. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, in 2000, the difference was that it was pretty much confined to tech with these ridiculous evaluations. I mean, you could have bought a bank in 2000 at a cheap multiple, um, but this yeah. time around pretty much everything got expensive and that has to be, uh, you know, correlated with low interest rates. But anyway, smart people agreeing with me. I like it. 
Um, mm. Although doesn't 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 let me well, that much. He scares me because you know I'm I'm the Vix Forty guy, and I would yep. be caught right in the middle of that. Drunk, you know, like <laughs> when it goes to five times, you know, ten times revenues, you know, I'll be buying then, mm. and then'll mm. you'll keep falling. But I'm not going to pick the bottom here. But yeah, um, mm. yeah, that should have really shook me up that paragraph when I read it too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> reminded me of you know these little bear market rallies we get. Um, yeah. Well, see, know. in 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 two thousand, see, I was I was working in the industry, but I was ignorant of analogs. The analog probably was uh, the Nifty Fifty of the late sixties, early seventies. You know, Kodak and all the they, these were new technology companies, right? And yeah. they all went up, oh, yeah. and it didn't matter. You could buy them at whatever multiple, didn't matter, and then they all collapsed about eighty percent. I mean, this this is what uh, Howard Marks ended up after that ended up going into bonds. You know, <laughs> he had an experience, bad experience there. Uh, so there is a you have to remind yourself there's a generation of people who don't probably know that historical analog very well um that yep. you know just because things we had a bad year in 2022 yes historically that means yep. the following year will be better mm -hmm. will actually usually be a very good year but there are instances in history where that's actually turns out not to be the case market peaked in march of 2000 march of 2000 didn't bottom until october of 2002 mm -hmm. um so it took Two and a half years. Not saying that's going to happen again, but it can happen. Yeah. Um. Here we go. So, what have you bought for us today, Tim? Cerulean. Yep. So I've had a look at this company before because I'm liking the UK. Everyone hates the UK. Um, one of the main reasons why everyone hates the UK, I think they're lifting their corporate tax rate from, I think it's eighteen percent up to twenty five percent. So yeah. you know. But if you if you understand what quality companies are, that's not going to matter so much because you invest in R and D. You can no one actually pays the corporate tax rate. You know, no. I don't care what people think. You know, um, so that shouldn't be a big scare. And then also, everyone thinks UK is you know because of Brexit has fallen off the cliff. Um, but mm -hmm. I think um, long equity a guy on Twitter um, just invested in this company, and I thought, oh yeah. well, I'll have another look at it again. Um, it's one of these sticky type IT companies and they make software for mobile phone companies around the world. And I thought, okay, yeah. well, there's nothing that special about that. That's not, but if they can get into a company, they've got their claws into you, which is what I like, you know, this moat type thing, you're not going to switch really quickly. Um, and they've got a really good business model. They basically don't do any custom work. They basically just build a, a software that works for basically everybody. Um, yep. So then they can scale that. So then that means they can lower their prices. And then also on top of that, they hire people from Bulgaria and India to do all the IT stuff. So they've only got a couple of people in the UK and a couple of people around Australia and a couple of salespeople. Yep. That's super asset light, as you can see from these margins, you know, you just mm -hmm. look and, um, you know, gross margins is 68%, you know, and then yep. look at operating margin is at forty one. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah so a good. lot of that is falling straight through to you, as you'll see from the cash statement. Um, and you can see the return on vested capital is just flying up in the thirties now. Um, yeah. they're moving to a SaaS type model. Uh, look at the interest coverage and payout ratio is only twenty nine percent. They've just so they've got heaps so of they're room. reinvesting. Yeah. Yep. And they're putting ten thousand hours a year into R and D, you know, which programming. So um, they haven't got really big clients, but they've got little modules so they can sell a little right. part of it to a big client. Um, and as they spend more on R and D, you can imagine all these um, custom software solutions they've got around the world, like people in Australia yeah. doing this IT infrastructure, they're just going to get obliterated because they won't be able to keep up with the costs and the updates and the upgrades that, that these companies are looking for. Um, yep. So they seem to be able to run a tight ship. As you can see from the numbers here, like, got, and they got no debt and hardly any employees, you know, um, and it's, it's only a, was it 300 million market cap or something? Oh, um, right. So it's small. Um, so yeah, I'm just really liking these. I'm trying to find these smaller ones now, which I think will grow over Into the next the quality companies. Yeah. Yep. And then be but the problem. There's a couple of downsides. The tax thing I mentioned, 
it's in the UK. So you've got pound exposure. Um, yeah. And it isn't a huge market cap and it's not well known. It's not like all the yeah. other businesses where you're going to get some retail investors, you know, go, Oh, what's this company? I might invest in it. Like it's mm. pretty hard to find and understand. Um, yeah. But yeah, the fundamentals are looking phenomenal. Um, and you can see from the price to free cash flow, it's a, you know, it's yeah. cheap. <laughs> like compared well, to what? Yeah, so about 4% yield. Yep. Like that. Yeah. So yep. yeah, that's not too bad. And you're getting a, a dividend while you sit and wait. And they yep. reckon, you know, I don't believe CEOs too much, but you know, they reckon the TAM is only, they only got 1% of the TAM, you know, but you know, <laughs> like I think every CEO yeah. says that, don't they? But oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. total addressable market is seven hundred trillion. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, okay, how much of that are you going to get? Yeah, yeah, but uh, it looks like you can imagine if you were a telco and you know you're paying a fortune for all this software, you'd love to, yeah. and they host it all now and everything, so you don't have to have any IT. You can just get rid of a heap of staff. You imagine that? How much these IT guys are paid in Australia to run these telco stuff? You can so, run so who's so what what is the actual so the it's supply and development telecommunications software solution so they they're supplying this to who Vodafone Telstra yep. or who yep. yeah and That's they who yeah and they just um they host it all so they not just selling the software they host yep. the actual whole system as well and then they basically mm. when you go onto Vodafone's website you can sign up for a plan that'll link into their website and sign you up mm -hmm. and give you a plan and then mail you out a sim card and you know and then also yeah. try and upsell you this is where they're very valuable <clears throat> i try and upsell yeah. you to pay tv or you know amazon yeah. prime or some other junk um still yeah. yeah 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 and so and if 5g for example you know they've really got to monetize this crap like they've spent all mm. this money all these telcos have spent all this money and no one's really you know spending the extra to pay for it um yeah that's why these guys have, are good because they've got proven track form of monetizing certain assets so yep um and you can imagine once you sign people up you know and you get them into this system it might be a little bit hard it might take six months or whatever but yep. there's no way you're going to switch out it, like you're not going to go back to a you know a custom type solution after this um mm. there is yeah. a couple of competitors there's cisco but they do mm -hmm. custom type solutions so the problem yeah. with that is everybody's different then so you can handle the bigger guys <laughs> But the smaller ones yeah. like Vodafone or, you know, Boost or whatever, um, they can't really, yeah, compete. You always want, you, yeah, it always makes me wonder, you know, we customize solutions. How much money and, yep. and you know, effort does that take? We've got to get a team just to work for this client. You know, is it better off just to have a generic product you yep. can plug into it? You know. But if it's a feature that everybody's going to use, you know, yep. you can say, oh, we'll, we'll build it for you. But then everybody yeah. gets to use it. Um, that's actually, yeah. that's yeah. actually adding benefit to everybody, and you give you that scalability. So I think this guy's yeah. quite smart. Instead of like, because the most approach is like, oh, we'll build you a custom solution, really look after mm. you, and it's like, oh, yeah. that's a nightmare to upgrade, and your development costs yeah. going forward are just, you know, just horrendous. Um, yep. If you can keep everybody in a, like, how different is selling a mobile phone to someone in Australia compared to New Zealand or PNG? It's not, mm. you know, the currency. And you can't, yeah. it's not that different, you know, um, mm. how much yeah. custom work do you actually need? Um, so I think, yeah, these, that's why on the next one, we'll put up the cash flow and the, um, you know, you can see the net debt and cash flow mm. them. That's a small business only making 11 million dollars worth of cash, but, um, yeah, but they've, they've quadrupled operating cash flow in five yeah. years. Yeah, that's not bad. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see that they really. And I think they'll grab as the industry, you know, gets more and more tight with cash. Like, yep. I don't know how much you spend on your mobile phone, but it's turning into a commodity, I think. Like, it's not really, people don't want to be paying $70 a month for their mobile phone bill, I don't think. No, I, I, I just signed up for an annual plan of, I think it's costing me 200 something for a year. Wow. 200 220 or 240 yeah like <laughs> like 20 bucks a month or less than 20 bucks a month and it's got uh, i mean i don't watch youtube on my phone I, I i mean i use it for work and i have to carry it with me all the time but um i mean it's just a bit of data and i don't i use about half the data that it's allocated to me so why would i pay any more than that yes 
and I think that's become that's going to become more and more the norm. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think you'd want a cheaper solution. You don't want to be paying, you know, have a development team of 10 guys trying to program and keep everything up to date. You'd rather mm. just outsource all that and pay a small fee per user. Um, seems like a winning strategy to me. But, yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go. Tim, uh, Tim's brought another one to add to the watch list. Um, put that one on your watch list, people. And uh, I guess we'll, we'll call it a day there. What do you think, Tim? Yep, sounds good. Yep, all right. We will see you uh, next week. Have a good one.